stop sharing and turn it over to you. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is of course insects. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So hello, um, again, my name is Ashley Colhanick. I'm an entomologist and an extension educator in Medina County. And I do love bugs. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about because they have a lot of really strange or unusual behaviors that make them very endearing to me. Um, they really are a very important part of our world. And I make it a point to try to engage as many people as possible in understanding and appreciating insects um, because there's a lot of misconceptions and fear and reactions that come with uh, seeing and knowing bugs. Um, but I'm trying to change that. So hopefully uh, you'll find something new and interesting about insects today. So um, insects are very, very important. 75% of all animals are insects. 52% of all described species from bacteria to plants to mammals to humans are insects, 52%, and we're still discovering more every day. And yet most people would claim to probably know very little about insects or what they do know is just, you know, their interactions, stomping them or their fears, uh, but they really are the creatures that run the world. And if there's one thing I'd like everyone to know is that if insects were to vanish off of the face of the earth, the environment would collapse into chaos. This is a quote from a famous entomologist, E.O. Wilson. And uh, this is really true because insects play important ecological roles in our world. From pollination to decomposition, insects really do make the world go round. So much so that ancient Egyptians worshiped insects, specifically the dung beetle, because they believed that they really did make the sun go round um, because they would roll that ball of dung across the sand. And they felt that perhaps a beetle was up there in the sky moving the sun across the sky. So bug worship is not a bad idea. I would encourage it um, because they do have roles to play in our world and they fill every conceivable nook and cranny and role or niches in our uh, ecosystem. So we'll have none of this, no bug squashing today. Um, we will be talking about some of the insects, some of my favorites, um, and we'll get to know uh, some of their behaviors better that might make you uh, see them in a different light. So of course I mentioned pollination and I'm guessing most of you are familiar with the role bees play um, with pollinating flowers, pollination that uh, results in the fruit that we eat. So I'm gonna start with an insect that's rather familiar and increasingly popular, the bee. So we're gonna skip over honeybees because there are plenty of programs about honeybees. Um, but just a quick refresher, um, bees and other insects uh, do pollination by collecting pollen um, and they move that pollen from flower to flower to help um, fertilize those flowers and that results in um, the production of fruit, which is very important. Bees are considered one of the super pollinators because they purposefully collect pollen from those flowers not accidentally, the way butterflies, beetles, and ants and flies do because they're not actively collecting that pollen to feed their young, um, but bees do, and so they are a super pollinator. Now, again, I said you probably are really familiar with honeybees, but let's take a look at the wool carter bee. So the wool carter bee is a um, solitary bee. Um, it doesn't have a colony. There is not a queen with worker bees. It's just a single mom out there collecting pollen and nectar to create bee bed for her young. She's doing all the work herself. She doesn't have daughters to do the work for her. And she gets her name, the wool carter bee, because she will collect fuzzy trichomes or wool, if you will, off of the leaves of um, pubescent or fuzzy leaves, think lamb's ear. Um, and so you see here that she's using her mandibles to kind of scrape that fuzz off this leaf. And she bundles it up under her abdomen and then she'll carry it off to a cavity. This could be a hole in a dead log. It could be a hole in your masonry or a tube or the hollow cane of a shrub. And that's where she'll use this uh, 
fuzz, this wool, to make a little bed for her babies. So here we have a video. And you see she's kind of vibrating because she's scraping off that fuzz. And so she's collecting it under her abdomen there. And then she'll fly off with that fuzz she's collected. And then she'll shove it into a cavity. And this could be um, one of our bee houses that are man-made. Um, we have mason bee houses um, and leaf cutter bee houses that look like this. And you can see that she's shoving all that fuzz in there to make a comfy little mattress, a little bed for her baby. She'll collect pollen and nectar and wrap it up into a nice um, bee bread ball. And then she'll lay one egg on that bee bread and then she'll stuff it full of more cotton. And that'll be an individual cell where that egg will hatch, the larva will feed on the bee bread and develop in that cavity. So again, uh, our solitary bees are very docile. They're not gonna be prone to stinging the way a solitary bee or wasp might because they have worker bees to expend um, to defend the colony. She's just out there doing the work on her own and she doesn't have time to be bothered with you. Um, so they're really great uh, bees to have, but uh, hopefully this one's a new one to you, collecting that little mattress for her babies. So I'm gonna take a little tangent here. So I mentioned that um, bees are one of the only insects that actively and purposefully collect pollen on their bodies to take back to feed their young. And other insects are often considered accidental pollinators because it'll stick to the fuzz on their bodies or on their legs as they're feeding for nectar. And then that pollen gets carried around um, to different flowers and hopefully it lands on the right one. Well, we actually have um, two moths that purposefully pollinate as well. These are not native to Ohio, so it's not one you're likely to run into. Um, but the yucca moth and the Sunita cactus moth both are recorded as purposefully collecting pollen on special scales on their abdomen and then pollinating the flowers of their host cactus. Then they'll lay an egg on that ovule of the flower and their caterpillars upon hatching feed on the seeds developing in the flower of the cactus. And so they are purposefully pollinating for the food source that their caterpillars need. So these are two other moths that are also considered purposeful pollinators. Pretty cool. So I'm gonna move on from bees and talk a little bit about wasps because they get a bad rap. We think about wasps as you know, aggressive and they're going to sting you. Um, so we do develop a distaste for them pretty quickly um, because they have stinging as a defensive strategy. Quick tip, only female bees and wasps can sting. Males do not possess a stinger because a stinger is a um, adapted ovipositor or egg layer and only the females lay eggs. So we whine, we think, oh, they're getting near our picnics, they're coming and they're landing on my soda can. And so I don't like wasps um, and hornets, but wasps are such a wonderful benefit to us and they have some really interesting behaviors. They are predators and so they are collecting soft-bodied insects, scales, caterpillars that might be pests in our gardens. And then they're gonna macerate and chew those caterpillars up and they feed them to the young developing larva back in their hive. Um, and so they're beneficial to have in the landscape. Um, but some other behaviors you might see are things like this. So this is a European hornet. This is our largest hornet here in Ohio. Um, recently, it's been confused with the Japanese or Asian hornet um, because it is so massively large. Um, but fear not, it's been here since the 1800s. It's a naturalized species that we do have here in Ohio. And this European hornet can sometimes be found stripping bark off of young trees and on tender twigs. Um, so they're stripping this to get the sugar or the phloem a layer of the bark it is felt. Um, sometimes you'll see them stripping it. They might be using it to build their nest, um, but they'll also be chewing on this um, nutrient rich uh, tissue for themselves as well. And this can be a problem because if it gets too much stripping, it can damage the branches. So that's one thing you might see them doing. You might also see yellow jackets and hornets um, in rotting fruit. So if you have an apple tree or crab apple, um, as those fruits start to fall and ferment and rot, they will um, try to eat those fruit and they kind of get drunk off of the fermented sugars. Um, but they are also going to be looking for sugary things and they're attracted to your pop because that's the fuel they use for their flight and their energy 
but then they're also collecting those um, caterpillars and soft-bodied insects to feed their young. Um, they are also um, one of the only wasps that flies at night, and you can sometimes find them attacking floodlights or coming to your windows at night and kind of bopping into your windows, because if there's a nest nearby, they'll find those lights to be a threat to their nest and they'll come and kind of get defensive around them. So if you find a big wasp at your um, porch light or coming to your windows, it might be that you have a nest in a tree or a cavity somewhere um, near your property. So I'm also going to introduce you to another wasp. So just like there are solitary bees and then there's bees that live in a hive, there are solitary wasps as well as wasps that live in a big hive and colony. So this is the grass carrying wasp. This lovely lady is probably someone you've run into, maybe not as an adult, but possibly her young. So she gets her name, the grass carrying wasp nicknamed the window wasp because she'll collect dried pieces of grass and weeds and she'll stuff them into any cavity she finds. And this is often going to be the track in a window or a screen. And you can see here, this was my home. Um, and you can see that there is, um, let's see if I can get my pointer over here, some grass filling this tread, this track of my um, screen. And in there she has, grass coupled with paralyzed grasshoppers and crickets. So she will sting grasshoppers and crickets. They are alive but paralyzed and she shoves them into that cavity, that track, that hole, wherever she's finding. And then she'll stuff around it grass to kind of be the filler creating those cells and then lay an egg on that grasshopper. And when the egg hatches, it will eat the grasshoppers alive. They're paralyzed, but alive. Uh, it keeps them fresh. And then that wasp will develop on the grasshoppers and then pupate in that track. And so from that track, they will emerge the next season. Um, so if you pull that material out, if you have a track or a window, um, you may find these as well. And again, they don't sting us. Um, they're solitary. They're pretty docile. They don't have a bunch of worker wasps to defend. Um, so they'll just go about their business and fly away. Um, and if you aren't a fan of grasshoppers and crickets, um, this would be a great way uh, to help maintain those populations. Um, consider that uh, when we think about a plague of locusts, Locusts are actually grasshoppers and in high enough populations, they can be damaging to crops and our plants. And so this is one way we keep grasshoppers and plant feeding um, insects in check is those checks and balances of predators and those that paralyze and feed them to their young. You might also find these grass carrying wasps shoving grass into other places. Often um, wind chimes are going to be a popular place you find them as well. If you put out bee houses for solitary bees, mason bees, grass cut, uh, the leaf cutter bees, they will also uh, use those holes to uh, stuff with grass and lay their young as well. So again, not a problem to have. Let them use those bee houses if you like, um, but um, they're beneficial to have in the landscape. Another solitary wasp that does some paralyzing with their stinger is the Eastern Cicada Killer Wasp. So you can see here that this is a female who is dragging a large uh, annual cicada. And so she stings a cicada and then she will drag it underground where she'll lay an egg on it, the egg hatches and she will, um, that egg will hatch and it will consume the still living but paralyzed cicada. So we are talking about our annual dog day cicadas that emerge later in the season around July, August, not the periodical cicadas that we're seeing brood 10 on the western half of Ohio right now. So these wasps are not active right now. They're not um, paralyzing our um, periodical cicada. They are only going after those dog day or annual cicadas that come out later in the season. And so they are a fan of sandier soils or looser soils, maybe in a garden bed or a landscape bed. And so you can see these kind of um, lumps of sandy soil that have been excavated. So she will dig down into looser soil or where grass isn't growing too well, if it's a little bare in the shade. And she makes kind of a runway. This um, exposed soil is a key to her, a visual cue for her to find her way back home. And it's a little runway that leads her back to the hole in the ground where she's dragging those cicadas. 
sometimes, well, most of the time, they're too heavy for her to just take off and fly on her own. So she'll actually drag them up into a tree if they were lowered down or if she paralyzes them up in a tree, grab onto it and then glide down towards her nest. Um, we've actually had um, pictures and reports of them actually carrying and climbing up the backs of people to jump off your shoulder and then glide down um, carrying that big, heavy cicada. I got a call from my mother-in-law who lives in Florida and she was like, what is this? So that is a really bad camera video from her phone and she loves murder mysteries. So in the background, you hear this really like ominous music as these big somethings are flying back and forth. And I'm like, well, I have no idea what those are until she got a close up and they are um, the cicada killer wasps in Florida. So they had just emerged from those very, very sandy soils in Florida where she lives. And they were flying back and forth to mate and then go off and start to collect the Florida cicadas that are down there. Um, so that was a bunch of cicadas going back and forth and back and forth in her yard. Um, but just a little fun, you know, again, they're out there kind of helping to maintain populations of cicadas. Here you see that a lot of pavers and um, landscaping stones are often sat on sand to kind of even them out. And so there must have been some nice sandy soil under there. But as you can see, those cicadas were just too chunky to fit through those holes. Um, and so just a little cicada killer humor there. But a lot of different wasps do this. And so um, the great golden digger wasp is another um, that will paralyze this time Katie did and drag them down into um, the ground. Again, not going to be an uh, issue with us. They're not going to sting us. They're not aggressive. They're solitary, just doing their thing. Um, and I often find these here in Ohio on mountain mint. So this is a popular pollinator garden plant, mountain mint. And I often find them there. So you see these bright orange golden legs. That is a beneficial wasp to have. Now, while these wasps paralyze their prey to lay an egg on for their larva to consume upon hatching, we also have parasitoid wasps, and they actually inject their eggs directly inside their prey into their bodies, and their young can hatch and safely feed on these from the inside out. And no doubt you have probably seen your fair share of tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm on your tomatoes um, covered in these white cocoons. So the Catesia wasp, this is a tiny wasp, she will use her ovipositor to inject her eggs into the body of a caterpillar. Um, they can also do this to the Catalpa hornworm seen on the far right. And then while the caterpillar is still alive, the eggs hatch and the larvae swim around in their hemolymph or their blood. They don't have veins, they just have big um, body is full of blood. And so it just sloshes around in there. And so they can, you know, swim around eating the fat bodies and the blood, avoiding important organs, and they keep it alive the whole time they're feeding until they're ready to pupate. And then they chew their way out of the body, ouch, and they spin their cocoons on the outside so that they have an easy way to escape when they're an adult. Upon learning about this behavior, Charles Darwin back in the 1800s said, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created parasitic wasps with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. And more so than just the fact that they can do this and it protects their young while they're feeding, but that there's also an element of brain control that happens here to our poor caterpillar friends. So we find that in some species, uh, when the cocoons are spinning their cocoon, the caterpillars are out and spinning their cocoons, the larva, you can see that this caterpillar, this green caterpillar here, is sitting on top of the cocoons of the wasp. It's still alive, but it's dying. You can see all the kind of black spots here on the side where they have chewed their way out and spun their cocoon below. And this caterpillar with its last life, it's going to protect and cover those cocoons until they emerge and then it will die. 
It will stop other predators from coming in who are trying to eat those cocoons. And it'll flail around wildly, shaking its head like, get away, get away. I'm protecting these as if they were its own children. But they're not. These cocoons are the larva, soon to be adult wasps that have caused its demise. But yet there's some trigger that has now brainwashed this caterpillar into protecting these cocoons that have killed it until they hatch. And it's really fascinating what insects can do to one another. There are even hyperparasitoids, which parasitize other parasitoids. So you can see here that these cocoons are the cocoons of a little wasp that has paralyzed and has eaten the inside of this hornworm. But here you can see another tiny wasp that's laying its eggs inside the pupa of this other wasp. And so paras paralyzing and parasitoids and feeding upon feeding, um, we're finding more and more tiny, tiny wasps in the world. And um, we're finding that uh, wasps and hymenoptera in general could soon become more diverse and have more species than beetles, which are currently the kind of reigning um, as far as the number of different species and diversity is in the beetles. Um, but we find teeny tiny minute little wasps that are even microscopic who are paralyzing and parasitizing other uh, creatures out there. So thankfully they're not doing that to us as far as we know. So moving on from bees and wasps, Let's take a look at this little critter. So this is normally a time where I would say, shout out what you think it is. Uh, but since we're here on a Zoom, I'll just skip to the punchline. So this critter is covered in fluff, white stuff, the bodies of its prey, um, a little bit of trash essentially. And these are lacewing larvae. So these are the larvae of this adult here. This is a lacewing. They are beneficial predators in the landscape. They're um, often considered aphid alligators alongside um, the multicolored Asian lady beetle larva. They have these big sickle mouth parts that they stab into soft bodied insects like scales and aphids. Then they rear them back and the juices slide down those sickle mouth parts into their mouth and they feed on the gooey soft insides of these insects. But sometimes they camouflage themselves with the dead bodies of their prey, or with frass, which is insect poop, or with fuzzy material from a leaf to protect themselves from being preyed upon, as well as to camouflage themselves to sneak in amongst their prey undetected. So again, if you do find this uh, adult, keep it, it's beneficial. We often find these on um, porches by porch lights. But you can see here a little better the larva underneath, but it's starting to pile leaf debris and other material on its back to say, I don't look like something you should eat. I don't taste good. I don't look good. I might not smell good. Um, but they also will try to do it to camouflage themselves amongst their prey. For example, here is some pictures of a larva that has covered itself with the fuzzy material from a sycamore leaf. So the underside of sycamores are pubescent, they have that fuzz, and they're scraping off that sycamore fuzz to put on its back so that I smell like the sycamore leaf. So that they can sneak up on the sycamore lace bug, which is their prey, seen on the left. So this is confusing. So there's lace wings, which are neuropterans, they're predators, and then the lace bug on the left, which is a hemipteran, a true bug with a piercing sucking mouth part. There are lots of different species of lace bug. They're a pest. They use that piercing mouth part to stab into the leaf, feed on fluids. Um, but here, now it's a more effective predator because it's covered in the sycamore leaf material. It smells like it belongs and it can sneak up on these lace bugs undetected and feed on them, thus keeping those pest populations in control. So we see camouflage a lot in the insect world. And a lot of people think, you know, these are stupid creatures. They're so tiny. They don't really have a brain. They have like bundles of neurons. How could they have somewhat uh, intelligence or forethought to do some of these things? And, you know, it might be evolutionarily 
you know, in them, um, programmed, but it's really clever how they can use camouflage to have a survival strategy. So here you can see the caterpillar of the wavy lined emerald moth, um, and they're using um, the ray flowers and the disc florets of the prairie cone flower to cover itself up. So you don't want to come and eat me birds or spiders because I'm just part of this flower here. And so they can feed on this flower relatively undisturbed because they've covered their bodies with pieces of their food source. We also see kind of an interesting habit, maybe not camouflage so much as just building itself a home, but we see here that we have a caddis fly, uh, the larva. It's order Trichoptera. They kind of look like moths when they emerge as adults, but they have much more uh, thin, fragile wings. The uh, larva are aquatic, and so it creates this cocoon underwater using rocks and debris and things that it finds in streams and flowing water to kind of protect itself, to be part of you know, the debris and things in that stream so I don't get eaten by fish um, or maybe some predatory insects in the water like dragonflies. And then it will cocoon and emerge as an adult. Well, some people have used this uh, insect's natural behavior to make a business. And so they can take caddisfly larva and they put them in artificial streams filled with precious gems, pieces of gold, pretty rocks, pearls, and they then will create that cocoon using whatever material they have available to them. And you can see here that once they emerge as adults, they can come in and harvest these cocoons that they have made out of beautiful, precious materials and sell them as jewelry. And so if you're ever looking for an insect made jewelry item for that special someone, uh, they do sell caddisfy jewelry, which is pretty cool. Another kind of, I'll say camouflage, but instead of taking leaf material or their bodies of the prey, these guys actually are excreting their own kind of camouflage or protection. So these are beach play aphids. They're found on American beach in Ohio's forests. And so it'll look like a little bit of a snow covered branch out there in the forest as you're walking. And they're excreting this kind of wooly material from their bums and they're affectionately called the boogie woogie aphid because if they're disturbed, they'll start to shake their bottoms and kind of say, don't eat me. I'm this big singular white thing. Um, but they're also very aggressive on their own. And if this shaking doesn't uh, disturb you enough or doesn't send a bird or a wasp or you know other predator away, they will actually kind of try to overpower whatever predator is coming along and they'll stab it with their mouth part. Um, here on the beach, they're sticking their piercing sucking mouth part into the tender twigs and they're sucking out juice and sap from the phloem. This can create a lot of um, sap and honeydew which can accumulate on the beach branches. And so we can see a lot of sooty mold as a result of um, their feeding. They don't seem to do a lot of harm to the beach as far as the, the overall health of the beech tree, um, but this kind of city mold can, in high enough numbers, shade out some of the leaves and um, lessen the photosynthesis, um, but it's not gonna be a really detrimental um, thing to the health of the beach overall. Um, and these kinds of sooty molds can attract wasps and things that are looking for sugary material. So you might find a lot of wasps hanging around. And the beach blight aphid often makes an appearance on our Buckeye Yard and Garden line, our blog for what's happening out there in nature. So you can always check it out at beagle, B-Y-G-L dot O-S-U dot E-D-U um, to kind of see what's going on with this and other insects and plant diseases. Another great insect that camouflages itself is the tortoise beetle. The adult is on the top and on the bottom, you're seeing the larva covered with its own poop or frass. So the tortoise beetle larva cover themselves with their frass to say, I don't look good, I don't smell good, I don't taste good, don't eat me. And there are lots of different species of tortoise beetles. They feed on bindweed, sweet potato vine. There's a thistle tortoise beetle, 
morning glories, but they are a beautiful beetle, beautiful insect, lots of different colors and patterns. They get that name from the kind of um, flattened out elytra or the first pair of wings that kind of looks like a tortoise shell. So that camouflage um, and protection survival strategy is really prevalent in a lot of insects. Some other fascinating beetle behaviors, one of my favorites is the whirligig beetle. So whirligigs are aquatic beetles and they get their name from this kind of swimming behavior. So they spin around and they whirl and they gig and they kind of collect together to look like a bigger organism. So I'm in this group here and to a fish, I might look like a bigger fish and no one will bother me. To a bird, I might look like a bigger fish and it's too big for me to carry. And so they swim at the top layer of uh, the water until they're disturbed and then they'll start separating. Some of the cool things about um, the whirligig beetle and a lot of other aquatic insects is they're able to um, kind of breathe underwater by trapping air pockets with their wings. As you can see here on its tail end, that it has an air bubble trapped using its wings and it can breathe out of its butt through that air bubble to stay underwater longer. You can also see at the front end, here are its eyes. It has bifurcated eyes or eyes divided in half. And so it looks like it has four eyes, but it's only two eyes and it's divided by part of its head. So it can see above the water when it's floating on top of the water to look for predators or me with my bug net because I love to catch these. Um, and then below the water for things like fish or um, the larva of a dragonfly, they would be predators that might go after these. And so it has a really good strategy for seeing above and below and breathe underwater for a while. And if they're disturbed, that group that are swimming around in unison, if they're disturbed by my net or you're swimming around or you're wading through that area, they send out a pheromone. Um, they can excrete this chemical um, that's thought to also help with surface tension and help them glide. Um, but they're like, help, something's attacking us. We have to you know, flee and they'll start to disperse. So if you catch one and you shake it and it starts to spread out that uh, pheromone, it smells like pineapple. And so I love catching them because I'm like, oh, you smell like pineapple, this is great. Um, but to each other, it's a warning to say, watch out, here comes Ashley with her bug net, run. So another beetle is the firefly. So if you didn't know, fireflies or lightning bugs are neither true bugs nor flies, they're beetles. And that first pair of wings, even though it's a softer leatherier, um, not so hard, it's still an elytra or a hardened first pair of wings that is um, characteristic of our beetle group. But they also have some great behaviors. And of course, really cool that they can light up their butts, um, but um, they can use it to communicate with one another. And so different species of firefly has different flash patterns. And so you can see here A through F, different heights, different flashing durations, different hopping and skipping that they do. They might do a short bleep bleep or a long bleep. Um, but different species um, are telling each other, hey, let's mate um, by blinking and they're attracting the species of the same blink. However, we have found that some females are able to change their blinking pattern. So I might be a species A and just do a little blink, blink. But then I say, you know, all this blinking makes me hungry. And so she might fly lower, maybe to where, you know, species C is, and she'll do a longer blink, blink. And the male of that second species will be like, hey, there's a lady. I'm going to go up and see if she'd like to hang out. And so he gets close and maybe he's like, hey, you know, let's mate. And she turns around and says, surprise, and she eats them. And so she'll disguise her blink as another species to attract a male for food and she will eat him. Because it's no good to eat a male of your own species if you're trying to reproduce and successfully have offspring, but there's no problem in eating another species which you can't mate with. So when they discovered this back in the 60s, the uh, publication was titled Aggressive Mimicry in Photorus, the genus of 
um, the lightning bug. Firefly Femme Fatales. And I just thought that was the best title ever. Um, so uh, they are, you know, brutal. You know, the insect world can be tough. And so she will disguise her blink to eat other species. Pretty amazing. Another pretty interesting insect that has some weird life cycles um, is the uh, mantid fly or the mantis fly. So this is in the order Neuroptera, so it's related to the lace wing. Um, and you see it's got this nice lacy, um, nervy wing pattern, but it looks kind of like someone did a Frankenstein experiment. They've taken what looks like the top half of a praying mantis and the bottom half of a fly and they stuck them together. This is actually a real insect. It has raptorial grasping forelegs and it is able to capture its prey, so it's a predator, and it has these great little uh, barbs on those forelegs for gripping and grasping, but they're hard to find. They are a rarity indeed, and I found this specimen um, at my porch one night, um, but some people didn't even think we had them in Ohio until I'm like, nope, I caught one. And the reason they're so rare and hard to find is they have a really fraught life cycle. So the eggs are laid and the egg hatches. That first instar has to crawl around and find a spider. And it may even be a spider of a specific species. Then they're going to hitch a ride on that spider. They're gonna use their mandibles to grasp onto a leg or they're gonna climb up onto its back. And they're going to ride the spider without being found and without being eaten by the spider. And then the spider is going to take it back to its den where the larva of the mantis fly hops off the spider and eats the spider's eggs. And if it can't do this, if it hatches and it is unable to find a spider or it's caught and is eaten, and it doesn't make it to the spider eggs to eat. It can't complete its life cycle. And so we don't get a lot of success here because we have to make sure that the eggs are laid near a spot where I can find a spider, where I can hitch a ride so I can find spider eggs to eat. Um, and so that's a really tough life to live uh, for this poor little larva of the mantis fly, but it does exist and we do find them here in Ohio. Another great predator to have just like our lace wing bug. So we will find eggs up on a stalk like this. So these can be the eggs of our mantis fly, or it could be the eggs of our lace bug, or our lace wing rather. See, I'm even getting them confused. Lace wings are not the same as lace bugs. And so if you find eggs on a stalk like this, leave them alone. They are going to be larva of one of these two beneficial predators to have in our landscape. And now that you've seen them, you'll start seeing them. So another weird and unusual creature um, could be this. And so we're looking at this and saying, what is that? Or rather those. This kind of snake-like discovery was sent to me uh, in September of a couple of years ago. And they're like, what is going on in my grass? Well, these are actually the larva of a fungus gnat. And ew, gross, fungus gnats are not something we like to have. Really commonly found in house plants that are overwatered or that came from a nursery, but they are in our environment as well. And what's happened here is there were fungus gnats in the grass. It's a sign of a really high organic matter. There might've been a lot of thatch here. Um, and uh, they were moving. So it could have flooded or too much water or not enough good food and they have to move, they have to get out of the way. And so in order to migrate, the larva come together to form a gregarious group and they bundle together to look bigger. I'm a big scary snake, I'm something larger than I am, don't eat me. And this strategy, you know, from a bird's point of view might work, um, but from a human's point of view, ew, you know, what's going on here? And they're kind of brutal. So we find that the stronger, bigger, chunkier 
larva of the fungus gnat, they will kind of move to the center and push the weaker larva out to the outsides of the snake coil. So that if something were to come and start picking off the larva, um, the weaker ones are gonna get picked off first on the outside of this tube. And then the stronger, thicker ones are gonna be on the inside of this tube. So if you ever see this kind of undulating group, it may be fungus gnats. So here's another interesting grass problem to have. And you might look at this and think someone has sprayed a herbicide incorrectly, or it might be drift, or it might just be seasonal um, drying and browning out. But when I was called to this property, we actually saw this was common army worm. And in the upper left picture, you see that there was a field that was recently mowed or sprayed. And from that field has come literally an army of these caterpillars moving from the hay field or the uh, grassy edge into the lawn. And you can see that they're feeding on the living grass tissue of this lawn. And when we zoom in, we saw that the entire lawn was just covered in the army worms. And as you walked across the grass, it was like walking on bubble wrap. They just pop, 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 pop. Um, and so you can see, unfortunately, they're also avoiding the weeds. So they're not even doing us a favor. They're avoiding the broadleaf weeds like clover and plantain, and they're feeding on the grass. And unless you control them, they will just keep on going through that grass until they're ready to pupate. And when they come across a obstacle, they went up the side of a, of a barn. And so they were just everywhere. And these ones could be getting ready to cocoon and pupate as well. Um, but they were just marching through eating all that grass. Let's talk about some interesting, weird mating behaviors now. So these are species of predatory midge. And they are not doing pull-ups, but you can see that they are hanging from a thin spider web. And these midges are actually hanging from this web, excreting pheromone to attract their mate. And they're doing this in a group because think of a bar setting. If we all go to one place together and we excrete our pheromones together, we're gonna have a higher concentration of that smell out in the air and we'll have a better chance of finding a mate. And so they all will just hang there, excreting pheromones, waiting for their mate to come and join them. Kind of a risky business if we're potentially going to be near a predator like a spider. Another great story of mating history in insects is nuptial gift giving. So these are dance flies in the family um, Empididae. And you can see that the female is the middle insect and she is feeding on a dead fly that she is um, chewing on, eating while the male who's hanging from the leaf is mating with her. And so a nuptial gift is a gift given by the male insect to the female in order to mate. Um, and so here he's given her a fly. Sometimes they'll give each other spit wads and sometimes they'll wrap up an insect with spit or silk to um, give almost like a wrapped up present to the female. We also know that sometimes um, these insects will give a fake present. So here is a scorpion fly. They also do nuptial gift giving. And um, you find these in forests where there's speckled light under leaves and underbrush. Um, and they'll hang like the um, dance flies do as well. And sometimes they'll give a spit wad or a silk wrapped thing that has nothing inside of it. So it looks like there's a nice juicy fly or bug inside of it. So by the time the female gets through the outer covering, and realizes there's nothing there to eat, he's already made it and scrammed. He's already left. And so they have found that some of the males have developed this kind of trickery to give a empty box to the female to mate and leave without having to expend the energy of actually capturing a real prey. Also, we find that if they're doing like a spit bubble, um, which have, is filled with 
um, proteins and amino acids that the female needs. Um, after he's finished mating, he might steal it from the female and run away to give it to another female. And so he doesn't even let her keep it before he steals it and gives it to another female. So this kind of gift giving for mating um, can be uh, fraught with uh, deceit and sneakiness. Um, so uh, nuptial gift giving is not all it's cracked up to be in the insect world. Um, here's where we get the name scorpion fly. The males have genitalia like a scorpion's tail and it's kind of curled up, but it doesn't sting. It doesn't have venom. It's just how it looks. So that's where they got the name. Um, and you can tell a scorpion fly, male or female, because it has this long kind of elongated um, head with the mouth parts at the end. And then finally, I'll talk about some galls. So good golly, Miss Golly. Um, a lot of insects will lay their eggs inside the tissue, the stem, the leaf of plants where their larva will develop. So this is strawberry stem gall, and it's a small wasp that lays its egg in the stem of the strawberry. And when I cut this open, you can see that each one of these little holes, these little cavities contains a small wasp larva that is feeding on the nutritive tissue of this plant and is developing inside safely until they're ready to emerge. But you may be more familiar with some of the ones that are on trees. So this is an oak apple gall and a um, gall maker wasp has laid their eggs inside a bud of a leaf. And instead of forming a leaf, a signal from the egg or from the female when she lays the egg says, build me a home. And the tree goes, okay. And instead of developing into a leaf like it's supposed to, it'll develop this round home for the developing larva of the gall maker wasp. So when you cut it open, you can see that in the center is the larva of the wasp. And this home that is built by the tree, let me be clear, the tree grows this for the larva that's living in it now. And you can see all these kind of veins are shunting to the center where it's sending nutrients to feed the larva. Then when it's done, it can chew its way out. So that is no longer living tissue, it's no longer needed to have nutrients, so it turns brown and dries out. You can see the hole where the adult wasp has exited, finishing its development, and you can cut it open. You can see where those nutrients were shunting into the center where the adult was, was um, developing. And we have so many gall species. Again, I really suggest going to the Buckeye Yard and Garden line if you're interested in galls because oftentimes they are a feature. So we have oak acorn galls, oak plum galls. Um, and you can see that these are actually different colors when you cut them open. This is actually one that has been used to create um, ink and dye um, in the old days. And so this one's cut open and you can again see some of that larva right there. So really fascinating that the tree and the plant can actually develop this for the developing larva to use. And so with that, we just have so many insects that are fantastic and amazing and do things that, you know, might be something you think of as really human, like giving a gift or really clever, like disguising themselves. But it is the tiniest creatures that are using these as strategies to survive and thrive in our ecosystem with every conceivable role that they do for us. So with that, I'll take any questions and thank you for learning a little bit more about insects. Thank you so much, Ashley. I don't know if anybody else was like, what? <laughs> like multiple Whoa. times throughout the presentation, like I was. <laughs> and that's why I became an entomologist. Is that kind yeah, of crazy there's... stuff? Like what? So. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> so fascinating. And yeah, so we, Ashley and Kathy and I were talking before we opened the webinar up about, you know, weird things bugs do part two, part three. Yes. <laughs> Obviously there's, there's just more like and more. World. 
to explore out there. So yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. We do have several questions. So the Fabulous. First, yeah, the first one's from Kathleen and she asks, I have run into European hornet nests in the woods. They were non-aggressive. Was I just lucky? Were you just lucky? So again, most insects, especially, you know, our bees and our wasps, they're not going to be aggressive for the sake of being aggressive. They're doing it to defend. And so a lot of our European hornet nests in the wild are really high up in a tree, um, in cavities. And so they're going to just sit there on the edge and watch you. And unless you're climbing that tree or cutting that tree down, they're not going to come down and really attack you. Um, and so as long as you're respecting their space and not disturbing them, they won't bother you. Um, you know, we see that this can happen with a lot of different insects um, that create hives. We have volatilized hornets and um, yellow jackets. And those things happen when like we're driving our lawnmower right by the cavity where those yellow jackets are. You're disturbing them. Um, so you can really get up close-ish if you're brave enough, as long as you're not threatening them. Excellent. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Another question. Oh, just a, a comment. This is a fabulous presentation. Thank you very Thanks. much. <laughs> Definitely read through the chat. There were a lot of great comments as well. And folks, just remember, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and not the chat box as we move forward. Sandy asks, do only female lightning bugs flash? No, they both do. So they're sending responses back and forth. Uh, let's see. John, I love this question from John. Um, I often have a bee that looks a lot like a wool carter that is so docile I can pet it sometimes for half an hour. Any thoughts on the species? <laughs> so um, a lot of bees you can pet because <laughs> um, I've done it. Um, again, be careful. They can sting if they need to. It could be that it was a male. So males don't have the ability to sting, but my, my suspicion is that it might've been early in the day and it was still cold. And so if it's cool in the morning and in the evenings, they aren't really as active because they're um, cold blooded. They need the environmental temperature around them to warm their muscles to work. And so in those cooler mornings and evenings, they really can't do anything to get away from you. And so they'll just hang out. Um, and then as you're petting it, you might be giving it enough warmth where it can finally be like, all right, I'm going to go. Um, but yeah, you can, you know, we've had things where we've like had people pet male carpenter bees because they can't sting and they're big. And a lot of them are really defensive of their territory. So the males of a lot of species will come up and be like, hey, hey, you know, get away. This is where my ladies are, I'm defending my territory, but they're all bluster if they can't sting. Um, and so this is true of carpenter bees. Um, this is true of the Eastern cicada killer where the males will just kind of like hover around your head and try to scare you away from their area. Um, but then you can just catch them and pet them. But be sure you know what you're catching because if it's a female, it will sting you if you catch it. And that's like threat. <laughs> yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I learned that the male carpenter bees, they have a little like yellowish white yes. spot, right? So that's a really- They have a big yellow spot on their forehead. Yeah, recognize them. Um, yeah. Male, male. And, and the activity, obviously, that, that Ashley described. Okay. Um, Laura asks, are there any activities or books for young children that are uh, very afraid of insects? Well, I think a lot of the insect friendly books um, are gonna help with children. I don't know of any specifically that are about dispelling fears, um, but I would definitely say go look at some of the books. I try to collect insect books for children just for my own little hobby. Um, so I have a lot from um, Usborne books is a good one that has a lot of cool like um, lift the flaps um, for insects. There's one called like Insectpedia that's like a pop-up book and it has like the parts of the bugs that you can like lift and things. Um, but um, no, I don't know of anyone specifically to like say don't fear bugs. Um, so if anyone knows of any, put it in the chat box. I'd love to know. Um, there's some about eating bugs, which is fun. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll second Usborne. I have quite a few of their um, nonfiction lift the flat books. And mm -hmm. um, I find just that and, you know, obviously kids do what you do. 
So as long as you're not acting fearful and you're saying, oh, cool, look at that, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that reflects a lot. At least that's worked so far so good with my six-year-old. <laughs> yeah. And that's a big lesson to all adults. Even yeah. if you're like, eh, <laughs> they will, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Kathleen asks, how do the WASP development determine sexes of young? Or how does the WASP development determine sexes of young? Is it temperature or something else? Okay. So um, I don't know about WASPs. It's probably the same as bees. But um, so some of our bee species can selectively fertilize their eggs. So if they fertilize an egg or they don't fertilize an egg with sperm, determines whether it's a male or a female. And so, for example, some of the um, cavity nesting bees, so the mason bees, um, the leaf cutter bees, they will selectively lay male eggs at the outer ends of their tunnels and the females closer to the interior because the men are expendable. One, two, they're gonna come out first and then they hover around the entrance so that they can grab the females as soon as they exit to mate. Um, and so they can selectively fertilize their eggs as they lay them. This one gets sperm, this one doesn't get sperm. And that determines the sex. And it's probably, though I can't confirm, the same for the wasps too. Fascinating. Um, Cornelia, Cornelia, sorry if I butchered your name there. Um, she's asking or, or commenting that some people are using uh, paper bag fake hornet nests to scare away mm -hmm. wood drilling bees. Does that work? It's one of those things where if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, it didn't hurt anything. Um, so I've seen a lot of people report that um, and it may work, may not. So it's worth a try, but it yeah. gives the impression of a um, paper hornet wasp or uh, nest or the bald faced hornet nest and things that are evolutionarily trained to know that that's a predator for me will stay away from it. Um, but it doesn't always work. Um, folks, there have been a, a few people that have, um, well, they've only shared it to the panelists, but going back to that question on children's books, uh, Kathleen said, Eric Carl, of course, very hungry caterpillar. That's a great one. And he's done uh, multiple other books as well. Um, and then Mary suggested the big book of bugs. And I will copy and paste that into um, the chat box for everybody because there's a, a list of authors there, but um, some, some other recommendations there. Okay. Mary asks, um, you didn't talk about praying mantises, so she has a question in, in reference to them. She said, late this winter, I collected five Chinese mantid pods and froze them. Is it a good idea to now pull them out of the freezer, slice them open, and put them out into my wild bird feeder for the wild birds to feed their young? <laughs> they probably won't be of any food for the birds because there's just the eggs. And since you froze them, their development has stopped, if not died. So it would have been better to let those pods um, survive. Like if you wanted to clip them and put them in one place near the feeder and then let them emerge all at once, they would have emerged as little baby um, praying mantises. And then those would have been potentially eaten by birds. Um, they're beneficial predators to have in the landscape. They're non-native, but they're what we'd call naturalized. They're not considered an invasive species. Um, so they're good to have one way or the other, um, but the case itself is not something I have seen consumed by other animals so much. So I don't think it's going to be much food to anything right now. Great. Okay. Joyce asks, what do you know about the gold-backed snipe fly? Okay. Why does it have gold? A gold oh. hook on its back. So I know of the fly you're speaking. Um, we see a lot of them at our nature center here in Medina. I actually took a lot of photos of them, but you know, I can't even tell you why it has a gold back or if it has a purpose or function. Um, so I can't, I can't add to that one. I have to look it up, but um, I know of who you're speaking and they are beautiful. Mark asks, why are army worm outbreaks so random? Well, so 
they are usually going to be laid by the moth in a, like a hay field or in scrubby edges because they're grass feeders. And so they are going to be a popular food for birds and other critters. So again, we usually have a lot of natural balance that happens between wasps that go after soft-bodied caterpillars, birds, we have some, you know, rodents can potentially eat them. Um, and so you can have a lot of environmental factors that go into killing them off so you don't have a huge outbreak as well as environment, weather, things like that. Um, but when we have instances where in this case, it was a field where it was probably a monoculture, probably a hay um, or it might've been corn. Um, and there's a lot of debris and stuff along the edges and still in that field, there's not a lot going on there. There's probably pesticide use. And so there's not a lot of predators there. And when they came in and killed off or mowed off that grass, they had nowhere else to go but into that lawn. So in this case, it was very um, situational to what was adjacent to the field and or what was adjacent to the lawn and what was happening there. Um, and so normally it's going to be more associated with the crop. Richard asks, well, it may not be a question, it might just be a comment. The insect that needs a spider to hitch a ride back to web must lay tons of eggs because of the survival of its kind. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. And Nikki asks, I have a big fat longish bee that keeps following me around when uh, my garage door opens and on her patio. Any idea why or maybe what it is? So it could be a, a carpenter bee probably a male who would be like, hey, you're near an area where I have a female that I'm interested in. Um, so it could be that big, fat, longish. Um, long. So we also have resin bees, but they're later in the season. So if it's happening right now, it's probably not that. It's probably a carpenter bee. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of right now. Um, carpenter bee, or it could be... Um, we might have some queen wasps or hornets that are out kind of looking for a place to start colonies. It's a little late in the season, so they might actually have already established it, but you'll start seeing early in spring, a lot of the um, new queens. So they mate in fall, the queens survive through winter, the rest of the hive does not. So tip for everybody, if you see a big football nest in a tree, or you're worried about yellow jackets that were in the ground, as soon as you get a really hard freeze, they all die except for the queen for next season. And then they have to go out and start all over again. So they don't reuse those nests. So if they're up in a tree and you see a big football, you can cut them down after a hard freeze and there won't be anything in there and they don't get reused. The only thing that can survive through the winter is sometimes European hornets that nest in wall cavities because of the heat that comes out of your home. It can help them survive through winter in some cases. So, um, the early spring, you can see a lot of really big queens because they're going to be bigger, they're mated, um, they're just heftier in general, and they'll be looking for a place to nest. And so sometimes you can get them hovering around, checking out your windowsills, seeing, you know, what's the traffic like, and then they'll set up shop. Anne is asking if you can comment on wool sour galls. I'm not familiar with that one. So I cannot. Ooh, sour galls. One of the other challenges with insects in general is the common names used by different people might not be what I know is the common name because there's not, there is an actual like official common name list held by the Entomology Society of America. But, um, you know, some people have names that they grew up with that might not be familiar. They're regionally um, specific. And so um, that could be the common name that is official or it might be uh, a regional one, but I'm not familiar with it. Clara asks, will such a dense population of armyworms, such as you encountered, increase mole activity? No, I don't think so because they are surface dwelling. They're not um, subterranean where the moles are actually feeding and they're so transient. They're not there long term. So um, they chew their way through, then they pupate and turn into moths and off they go. So um, no, it wouldn't affect moles. Good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Denise is asking, what are sweat bees? Sweat bees. So 
first let's clarify that there are sweat bees and there are sweat flies and sweat flies are usually what we confuse as sweat bees. So sweat flies have two wings, bees have four wings and they have yellow and black stripes on their back. And so these are pollinators. They're often on flowers. They're often called flower flies or hover flies. Again, common name issues. Um, but they'll land on your skin and they'll, they'll drink at the sweat on you, but they can't sting, they can't bite. Um, no problem there. Sweat bees are often in the family Helictidae. So they're um, metallic. Sometimes they're um, metallic green or they're metallic green on the thorax where the wings are, and then their abdomen is striped. Um, and sometimes they're attracted to sweat, but they're again, pollinators, they're collecting nectar and they're collecting pollen um, and they're nesting in cavities or in the ground, and they're solitary. And so sometimes they're called sweat bees too. Excellent. Um, Darlene, has a question about our cicadas. She's asking if you are allergic to shrimp or sell fish, should you not eat any brood X? Um, she heard it on the news and was wondering if it's true or not. Correct. So um, it depends on what part of shellfish you're allergic to, but most doctors aren't going to get that in depth. But um, because insects are related to shellfish, they all have that exoskeleton. Um, and so that part of the um, cicada or any insect with the shellfish of a shrimp or a lobster, they all have that hard exoskeleton. And if that is what you're allergic to, whatever that protein is, the chitin in that exoskeleton, it could be your trigger. And so um, that could be a cross allergy. And so we do not recommend eating any insect if you have a shellfish allergy or seafood allergy. Um, so we've done a lot of kids programs where they can try insects. And unfortunately, more and more we're finding that kids have food allergies and we have to alert the teachers and the, and the parents to let them know that if your kid has a seafood allergy or you're even concerned about it because like maybe someone in your family does um you know know that there could be this cross allergy and they shouldn't try it on our watch because you know food allergies are very severe mm. so i've been working up to like trying to eat bugs uh -huh. and now i have a reason that i don't have to <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I did not know that. So yeah, thanks for asking that, Darlene. That's really interesting. Well, we're going to stick with a few more cicada questions because we mm -hmm. have. Um, so Kate says she's in Cleveland. She has some friends in Cincinnati posting mm -hmm. pictures of the cicadas. She hasn't seen any. She's wondering if she's going to in Cleveland or did they miss out this time? We missed out this time. So our brood for Cleveland in our area was um, in 2016. That was our big periodical cicada and we're done. Um, so everything on the western side of Ohio's brew 10, it's not gonna extend this far. And we thought, well, there could be some stragglers. Um, you know, some people might've collected them 17 years ago and brought them home. Um, so we're asking people to report them if they see them, but we haven't gotten any reports yet. And they've, they've been emerging for quite a few weeks now. So nothing here. Great. And then Emily asks if there are predators for the 17 year cicadas. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So one of the, the theories for why we have 17 year cicadas that emerge every 17 years in huge, huge mass is a survival of predation. They don't have bad taste. They taste delicious to everything. They don't have a really strong defense of anything. They, they're weak flyers. They can't really escape. And so they're going to get eaten. They're going to get eaten by everything. Geese love them, dogs love them, um, squirrels and, and rodents love them. So they're going to get eaten and eaten and eaten. And by the time they're all as big as houses and full, there's still a million zillion cicadas to reproduce, lay eggs, and give you the next generation. So it's a survival strategy that we're going to pump out all these populations. And yeah, we're going to sacrifice a bunch of them to being eaten but enough of us are going to survive that there's going to be a million more in 17 years. So yeah, there's a lot of things that eat them, including people. So that topic just, it just fasc fascinates me. Like why 17 years? I mean, I get the strategy, but like why so long apart? Yeah. That part I can't tell you. But, I, know. Um, I was talking about that with my husband the other day. We're like, I don't, he's like, do they ever like emerge 
15, 14, 16 years? I'm like, I yep. don't think so, but I don't know. So we have 13 year cicadas, a smaller population, smaller brood areas, but there are 13 years. And sometimes we have stragglers. So we can have early emergers, very rare, but it can happen. And then we can okay. have a late emerger. So that area of Western Ohio might have some come out next year, just here and there. Um, okay. So it can happen, just kind of a fluke. Um, there was a, someone talking about them um, that it, the 17 years could be a, a, a reflection of like the ice age, like they had to stay underground because there was ice and glaciers covering everything, but that's just, you know, people guessing and theorizing. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's all of our cicada questions, unless any. Okay. Can. Oh, what? Nope. One more came in. Um, somebody from Bowling Green, Debbie asked, well, I'm in Bowling Green. How far south do I need to go to see cicadas? <sighs> I'd have to look at a map. So yeah. I think they come as far east as like Morrow County. Um, and so you'd probably have to maybe an hour and a half drive um, southwest. Help me out, Kathy, you know the. <laughs> well, like how far up central are they com coming? I mean, they're in Delaware. How are yeah. the counties above? So and we're not, we're not see if I can find the map. in Morrow. Um, no. We had, okay. a, we had them a few years ago when Mansfield was hit right. really bad. At least I'm in the northern part of Morrow County, so unless southern, um, yeah, it would be how far west. Okay, I'm pulling yeah, up like that they went it. almost to the Power. state line. So the last map, so the, the 2021 map is based on 17 years previous. It shows that there's a little pocket in Seneca County, Wyandotte, Marion, Western Morrow. So again, this might not be accurate from 17 years ago anymore. Definitely mm -hmm. Delaware. Um, they go up as north as Allen County, Hardin okay. County. Um, so they're not in the upper, upper corner. But she wouldn't have to come far south. Yeah. No, maybe Hard an hour or so. Allen. Yeah. 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 And again, that's based on, I'm going to share that, um, 17 years ago data. And what happens is 17 years you ago, you have 17 years where development happens, trees are cut down, forests are decimated, and we build new houses. And anywhere where there was forest and it was cut, clear cut, you might not see those cicadas any longer because they need the root systems of trees to um, feed on. And so we see a lot of that where you can be driving along and it's cicada, 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 and then silence because you're now in like a new development. Mm -hmm. um, and so areas where you might see little um, tips into like Crawford and Hancock and like Morrow here, those might've been areas that have been developed since 17 years prior. So, well, I and this is that 2016 for brood five. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't been to the Northern part of the County of late so, or the Western part. So I don't know yeah. if they're emerged or not. I don't know. So but that's uh, the, we have a cicada fact sheet on ohioline.osu.edu. So if you want to see that map, you can check it out. Uh, we have a comment that says, my grandson says cicada shells taste like unflavored pork rinds. Hey, there you go. Yeah, you that makes sense. Like. <laughs> Not too shabby. Um, we do have a few more questions on cicadas. Mm -hmm. If you move cicadas from Southwest Ohio to another part of the state, will brood X develop there? Possibly. So you'd have to um, bring enough that the, they would lay eggs in the trees and that those eggs would um, hatch, survive, and then they jump out of the branches after they hatch down into the ground and then bury themselves. Um, and if you just brought a few, you'd have to make sure, have they made it already? Do you have males and females? But they can. And so we do see weird pockets where you know someone might have brought one And then the last cicada question as of now, are cicadas only in the US? Yes, they are unique to North America. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, so at least the periodical cicadas, let me clarify. So there could, there are you know, cicadas elsewhere, but periodical cicadas are unique to North America. And people come to see the phenomenon as a tourist attraction. So that's cool. Really awesome. I've heard of people coming from like Japan to see them, so. 
It is pretty. Bad. I'm like my fellow bug lovers. Come on, <laughs> flock to me. Yeah, swarm to me. I should say. Uh, okay. Uh, Camelia asks, "Can praying mantids kill hummingbirds?" I have heard it said. I've never seen it. Um, you know, there's been pictures and stuff. Um, I, I don't know how common it is. Um, I don't know if it's significant to make an impact on hummingbird populations. Um, so I've never, I don't know, that probably isn't enough or frequent enough to cause an issue, but I've never run across it, but I've seen people report it in pictures, but. Same, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Frank asks, are gall, are gall wasps beneficial to trees in any sense? If not, what defenses do trees have against them? Well, you could say that they benefit by, you know, as they develop these galls and things, you might have some branches and tips die back. And so it might be a little bit of a natural pruning. But in most cases, when we have um, insect developed galls, it's going to be in the leaf tissue. And so it's not really harming anything, but that there's not, there's one less leaf. Um, you can see galls form in the branch tissue of trees where it actually can be a significant damage to the tree, but those are usually caused by fungus. And so you get these big growths um, in the, the vasculature and the branch tissue. Um, and so that can cut off the flow of nutrients and cause dieback. Um, so I have never seen a report of significant health issues as a result of insect driven galls, um, but it might have some pruning benefit if any, um, otherwise it would be just kind of a neutral issue. Um, or if there is a benefit, I haven't read about it yet, or it hasn't been studied yet. Anne asks, should we worry about commercial spraying of home yards for mosquitoes? So mosquito spraying for yards is, in my opinion, a little bit of a myth, because if you have your yard sprayed, they can still come from the neighbor's yard, the neighbor's neighbor's yard, and from anywhere. These are good flyers, and they fill those gaps. Insects are great at filling niches, and if you're not going to have this magic bubble around your house. Um, so what I suggest is if you're having issues with mosquitoes, the first thing is you have to check your home, your landscape for puddles of water, um, bird baths, pots, dips in the topography of your yard where water can pool. Um, that's the number one thing you can do to eliminate mosquitoes is get rid of those breeding sites because they can breed in, the, in a pop cap or a water bottle cap turned upside down. Um, so you really gotta watch where that water puddles. Um, and then if you do have a serious, serious issue with mosquitoes, you can contact your health department. They may be able to come out and put out traps. And if the volume is high enough, then they may be able to come in and help spray or do an assessment for you. Um, but it's going to do more harm to other insects in your yard than it's really going to help reducing how many times you're bitten by mosquitoes. Um, use um, the products that are, are labeled for repelling insects, so deep-based insecticides, um, lemon oil of eucalyptus, not lemon eucalyptus essential oil. It has to be oil of lemon eucalyptus, um, which um, there is uh, insecticides that work on that. Um, the bands, the wristbands don't work. The, <laughs> um, the patches, there's insecticide patches, they don't work. Um, the like skin so soft, it only has a range of like 20 minutes and then you have to reapply. So really read the research about insect repellents and mosquito repellents and tick repellents because there's a lot of bad information out there about what works. Um, and so those citronella candles are good, but they're going to have a very limited range. Um, the insecticides that are in a fan, like it's a clip-on fan that you clip to like your belt, they work, but they only work in a limited bubble. And if you're too tall, it doesn't work for like your head. And so we find that people who are really tall and use those actually have limited protection on their face because um, they're too far away from where the clip on is. Um, so that's going to be your better bet. Good information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So David says, I think of pill bugs as something that you'd find under a a decomposing log board or a rock, but I've seen them recently inside 
an indoor natatorium slash swimming pool complex. And yeah, I'd be attracting them, the humidity. Yes. So first of all, pill bugs or potato pugs or woolly polies are not true insects at all. They're isopods, they're terrestrial crustaceans, um, and they have more than six legs. There's different kinds. There's sow bugs, there's pill bugs. Some of them can roll and some cannot. And so sometimes a kid will be like, it won't roll into a ball. And they're trying to get it to roll because it can't and you're crushing it. So just my little two cents there. But yeah, so we normally think of them in decomposing moist habitat outside, but they're attracted to moisture. And so the humidity and the fungus that grows as a result of humid habitats, like an indoor pool, um, that can create habitats where they're going to make their way in. The wall voids, sometimes mold can build up in between um, the space and the wall where like wood is um, in the construction that can get a little moldy that they might be um, living on and developing in. So a uh, dehumidifier, if you find them in your basement or anything, um, is the way to go. But they're harmless. No big deal. Okay, Nikki is asking, any way of re relocating a large black ant colony? They have, uh, apparently are living in a mound of soil. They are finding their way into her house. So this is the one insect where I'm going to say, don't try to relocate them. Just control them. <laughs> um, ants are rough. They're hard to control. If you have found the nest, that's the hard part. Um, and so if you know where the nest is that's causing ants in your home, you can have a professional come or you can treat it. You want to use granules so that the ants will carry them down into the nest and feed it to the other ants. This can take a couple weeks to a month, but that's the best bet. Um, using those granule baits. They also have little bait stations that you can um, click into the ground around the nest that they'll go in and that'll protect that bait from being taken by other insects or pets if you have them or children. Um, you can also, um, you know, call a professional, you can dig it out, um, but uh, don't worry about relocating it. Don't feel guilty about this. Ants are everywhere. They're not endangered. <laughs> They're not um, at risk of being you know, it's not going to be the end of the world if you have to kill an ant nest, so. Linda says, great job, Ashley. You make Medina proud. Thank you. Oh, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Med uh, Linda's, yeah, Medina. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so what, what are the questions just keep coming in? I keep thinking we're almost done, but no, they keep coming. Okay. Heck, okay, okay right. Ashley? Yeah. yeah, I'm good. All right. Um, so Richard uh, left a comment, when a bee follows you around, it could be your scent or perfume acting as a lure. True. Didn't know that. Uh, Jennifer is asking, are there different species of mantid flies? Mantid fly. You know, probably. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I would say yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know how many species are in Ohio. Um, so, but yes, there are more than one species worldwide, but um, I don't know how many different species are maybe in Ohio because they are so rare. Um, so I've only found the one ever. So that one. <laughs> and I killed it. So who knows if it was able to, um, you know, lay eggs or if it was a male or female because I was like, oh, it's going to my collection. And then I learned about how, how fraught its life is. I'm like, man, <laughs> poor thing. Okay. Um, a couple more cicada questions. Do you, do you, Fred's asking if you should remove cicada wings before eating them? Yes, you should eat them before they pupate into, or not pupate, before they molt into the adult. So they're true bugs, they don't have a pupation stage. So you get the um, larva coming out, the, the nymphs coming out of the ground, and then they're going to emerge from that exoskeleton with wings. You should eat them when they just come out of the ground before they molt with the wings. But if you're gonna eat them, take the wings off. But um, you wanna catch sticker? them when they're still soft. <laughs> yeah, because they get harder and crunchier. Yummy. Well, not, I won't say crunchier, but you know, more uh, chewy. Um, I, so well, I got, right I when- Eat them soft, stir fried. Kathleen is right there in the chat box. Right when they come out, if they're okay. just molting and they're still white, you can rip those wings off and fry them. Uh, so I was just going to ask. So what's how how do you eat them? Stir fried. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Carolyn 
says that I heard that cicadas don't lay eggs in pine trees, but the ground in my pine forest was loaded with cicadas. That's not true. It's not as obvious and not perhaps as dense, but Kathy and I found a uh, evergreen branch. I don't remember if it was a spruce or a pine, but we found the scarring mm -hmm. of that egg laying at the Mansfield campus. So they do. Right. Um, it's just either not going to be as obvious or not going to be as heavy because, you know, they have to navigate around the bristles to get access. And there is sap mm -hmm. that might make it harder for them to survive that, you know, penetration and laying that egg, but they do use evergreens. Now, when they, when they emerged at Mansfield, I think Marnie and I were out with the capstone students and we yeah. were all like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> we realized pine. Yeah, pine what all those holes there. in the pine stand coming out of the ground were. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Nancy's expressing her concern that she has lots of clover in her yard, but she's seeing very few bees. She says it's worrisome. Well, that's, that's always an issue. Um, people yeah. noticing fewer insects year to year, um, whether it's, you know, because it's the wrong time of year for them, or you don't have enough other um, pollinator plants in your area. So we really just say, you know, plant more attractive flowers for them that are season long blooming because you can't expect to have bees show up when that one thing blooms. So if all you have is clover, there's nothing that has brought them there season long to develop and um, continue to reproduce in that area. And so it's not going to be enough. Um, and then the same with, you know, your neighbors, if you're the only yard with flowers, it'll make it harder for you to have um, high populations of bees. But I mean, it, it's been noticed by many across the state. Yeah, that makes sense. Katrina, uh, Katrina asks, how long will springtails live and will they repopulate themselves in a terrarium? So springtails probably could be kept in a terrarium. Um, they're pretty durable little guys. So springtails, for those who don't know, they're tiny, um, primitive insects. They're usually white to purple. They have little tails that uh, called a furcula that springboards them like a catapult um, and so they can bounce around in your soil. They like high organic matter and, and um, mulch and things like that. Um, and so they're pretty easy to have. They're really ubiquitous. We have them, you know, anyone can pull up some good soil and there they'll be. Um, so you need high moisture, high organic matter if you want them. If you're having problems with them in a terrarium, it's because you have high moisture and high organic matter. Um, and so um, drying that terrarium out and letting everything get like really, really dry um, could help, uh, but there could be eggs that survive that process. Um, and they're, they're kind of, um, I wanna say ephemeral because even though they're there, there's like peaks of populations where people will call and say, I'm having issues, they're everywhere, they're all over my porch, they're getting into my, windows because they're small enough to fit through screens and if you have a lot of uh, organic matter right under a window they can hop up on the screen just by accident um, and then they'll be gone and so um, that's I don't really know if it's just seasonal or the weather dependent but they can be a problem um, when they get into windows or high enough populations but usually they'll ebb and flow and go away on their own there's not really any pesticides that are labeled for them because usually if you spray them they just rebound and the population is like twice as big so uh, I'm not sure if that was a, I want them or I don't want them question but it's not really worth spraying them and if you want them moisture and organic matter is the way to go Brian's asking about brown marmorated stink bugs. Ah. Constantly getting into the house. How do you discourage them or repel them? You don't. Um, it's really not practical. Um, so going around the house and finding cracks and crevices that are really obvious that you can fill. Um, so there's a lot of pipes that exit homes where you have um, vents from like your heater and your stove and your um, dryer. So going around those and making sure that the area around those vents are sealed well is good. Don't seal off the, whole, the vents themselves. They need to vent out into the atmosphere for your safety, but sometimes the seals around them can be big gaps that let insects in to the wall voids um, between the house. 
Um, they get into soffits, so your attic soffits. Again, you need vents in your attic to let air in, but you can put screen material on those vents if they're big enough um, that are letting insects in. Um, look for gaps under doorways, holes in screens. Um, so if you're really wanting to put that effort in, that's what you gotta do. Um, some people talk about like those barrier sprays. So there's home barrier sprays that you do around the house for like ants. Um, they don't last very long at all. Um, they, get, they break down really quickly in rain and sun. So if you're worried about it and you wanna give those a try, um, you would do them in fall when the invasion of those stink bugs happens. But keep in mind that a lot of insecticides have to be ingested or come in full contact with an insect. And so the residual wouldn't be enough for an insect that's going into hibernation, it's no longer feeding and it's just flying by. They're not sticking around the side of your house long enough to be exposed to that pesticide long enough to make a difference. Um, so I don't, recommend spraying for stink bugs. Um, vacuuming and sealing up your house is really the best bet. Understanding that they're not harming your house. They don't lay eggs in your house. Uh, they just smell like cilantro and they can stain if you crush them. So I understand it's a big nuisance and a lot of people have struggle with them as well as the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Um, so just sealing up the house is the, really the only practical but time consuming way to do it. Thanks. Uh, another question about lightning bugs. Besides being a delightful part of summer, what ecological services do lightning bugs provide? Are, um, are they experienced, experiencing any increased threats? <laughs> So they do experience increased threats. Um, things like spraying for mosquitoes is one thing that could impact their population significantly. Um, they're predators, so they're beneficial in that way. They can be food for um, other creatures. Some of them are aquatic as larvae, and so they can be fish food. Um, so they're just part of that balance, you know, out there, um, predators, as well as potentially being food for others. Um, but yes, they do experience um, water quality for the ones that are aquatic can affect their survival and their um, populations. And then um, the pesticides we use can affect them as well. Carolyn's asking what you think about using borax mixed with powdered sugar to kill ants. I am not a fan of homemade anything because technically it's not labeled for that use. And um, by law, that is illegal. Um, I think that there are better products than borax. I know it's a really common old one that's used. So, you know, it's used, but I think that the stuff you can buy that's granules, that's baits, the bait houses, they just work so much better. Um, especially because some ants aren't sugar feeders. Some ants are looking for protein. And so you can buy baits that are protein based. Um, they're like peanut butter kind of things. Um, and, and like, uh, or like they have bait stations that have both the protein on one side and the sugar on the other. So if you have a species that's not in either sugar seeking at that time in the season, or they're just not a big sugar feeder, it's not going to work either. Okay. Um, Frank's asking, do all gall wasps affect only leaves? Um, he thinks there was a gall wasp that attacked the flowers of chestnut and prevents yep. the seeds from germinating. So not just leaves, there could be flower buds that they go into too, absolutely. Um, and it would prevent, you know, if it was on flowers, it wouldn't, um, it would prevent that flower from then being pollinated and turning into a fruit. So yeah, that can be possible too. But overall, it wouldn't affect the health of the tree, but it would affect the reproduction. No. Um, Cornelia is uh, saying when she was uh, when she was in UP in the UP of Michigan, flies were attracted to her blue jeans, but not her son's green pants. Um, do they have a color preference? Do they like the color blue? She said she looked it up and found it was true, and then her son said she looked like pink uh, pig pen on Charlie Brown. Oh, so some insects uh, are attracted to different colors. Um, so like mosquitoes are attracted to dark colors. Um, so that could be it. I'm not sure what kind of flies they were, but, um, and it could also be things you're not noticing. So 
the fabric of the jeans might be holding a different amount of like fabric softener or scent in them. Um, and, you know, not saying anything, but I know that I wear my jeans more than a couple of times before I wash them. So it could be, you know, dirt or other things on your pants, but if they're worn more than once, um, that you just can't smell or notice, but the insects can. So hmm. depending on the species, but because I'm thinking like dark green, dark blue, is it really that different? Um, but it could be, um, a color thing or it could be something else. Yeah. Kathy says she covered her new climbing roses with netting. Will the cicadas be attracted to the bushes? Can she uncover them? I don't know of any reports of cicadas laying eggs in roses. Could it happen? Maybe. But I don't know if it's a prime spot. Um, but if you are in cicada territory, I would leave the netting on just in case because you don't want to risk it. Good call. Uh, Denise is asking how you can tell the good praying mantis from the bad. So again, I wouldn't say there's a good and a bad. Um, so there is the Carolina mantis and there's the Chinese mantis. And again, it's naturalized. So it's been here a long, long time. And there's no record that I'm aware of that the Chinese mantis is causing an impact on the native populations in a way that we define it as invasive. Um, but um, so the Chinese mantis is larger and it's really green. The North Carolina mantis is, or the Carolina mantis is smaller and more brown. That's really kind of it. But also keep in mind that the male and the female um, are different sizes. Um, so the female is gonna be larger. It's gonna have that rounder belly when it's getting ready to lay eggs. And the male of the Chinese is gonna be a little smaller then. Um, but um, the Ch Carolina madness is smaller generally. Nikki says she found a wasp, uh, possibly, nest on the eve of her house that was papery gray, round like a large egg, but had a tubular tail on the bottom that the wasps entered slash exit, exited. Okay. Yeah, ideas of the species. Was it, so was it open like a lotus or was it closed like a small nest, um, like a baseball or something? Um, if it's got a tube out the bottom, it makes me think of like a potter wasp, but theirs is gonna be made more out of a mud um, than paper. So I'm not sure. A um, little more detail or you're welcome to send me a photo to my email, which is callhannock.5 at osu.edu. Um, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and I put my email into the chat box. Perfect. Um, so Bill is asking if you can, <laughs> this is a big question, Bill. Can you give an update on spotted lantern fly in Ohio? <laughs> well, that's a whole presentation all the time. Yeah, own. right. <laughs> so um, as far as I know, and I have probably not as up to date as I should be, um, it was found in Jefferson County and they've been monitoring for it. There are, um, there's a network of volunteers that are watching um, Alanthus, the tree of heaven in their respective counties to make sure they don't start seeing it in other counties. Um, so people are watching for it and reporting for it. Um, but I have not heard of it spreading beyond the find in Jefferson and Kathy is confirming that. So All right. <laughs> going back to the, the wasp or the question on that wasp nest, Nikki said it was closed like an egg. Closed like an egg. I need a picture. I'm not sure. Send her a picture. <laughs> yep, I hear you. Okay, Steve asks, what's the best way to control uh, slash repel chiggers in a landscape or open field situation? Chiggers are a rough one. I don't even know if DEET is really effective on them. So chiggers are a, the larval stage of a mite. Um, so mites not being insects, they have eight legs. Um, when they're in their larval form, they actually have six legs and they molt and then they have eight. Cool fact. Um, and so what they do is they attach at a follicle, a hair follicle, and then they actually excrete saliva and it dissolves the skin cells and then they suck up the melted skin cells. So they're not biting into you. They're not feeding on your blood. And because they're so small, they're microscopic, you're not seeing them. Um, I can't even imagine how you get a repellent 
or a, a product that would get to where they're at while they're like dissolving skin cells that could cause <laughs> cause them to be repelled or killed. Um, so, um, you know, obviously use your insect repellents when you're out in high uh, grass areas. Um, mowing the lawn can help keep some populations of things like ticks and fleas down in a yard, but chiggers kind of break the rule book on that because again, they're so small. Um, you know, pants, you know, wash yourself really well when you come back from those areas. If you're wearing shorts or if you've been rolling around in the grass or walking your pet, you know, wash your legs down. But they're kind of just a inescapable part of Ohio summers. I really got to feel <laughs> sorry. <laughs> do you know how long they're on you? I do like not. Your skin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's very long. Yeah. Because yeah. I, it's I not, just learned that, you know, that they don't like embed into your skin. I think that's right. a big myth. That's what a lot a big of myth. Say, but they don't. So then, you know, the next question is, well, how long? And I guess it's just whatever their saliva that is what our mm -hmm. skin reacts to and so severe. So they're not even present that long. It's the yeah. residual reaction okay. our body's having to yeah. the saliva. And so right. we react a lot longer than they're actually feeding. Yeah. And that's another thing is like, you're thinking, oh, I got to kill these things. I got to, you know, put something on right. me. It's not, it's just a reaction. So then you're going right. to things like Benadryl and hydrocortisone cream or your doctor um, mm -hmm. for the reaction you're having. Yeah. So you can spray. I mean, when I was working in the field every day, I was always spraying my pants with, um, you know, a repellent from at least the knees down. And mm -hmm. I have to say that certainly extremely cuts down on the amount and how often you end up with chiggers on you because yeah it seems like you know they gotta if you if you're walking through they gotta come up and so yes. if you've got the repellent on your pants um they're less likely to get very far yeah and you know the those repellents are labeled for chiggers and they say they are repellent to them so they've had to do some tests <laughs> to be able to say that but if you sit in the grass you're done yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here's a fun question from Nikki. With all your vast knowledge, Ashley, do you have a favorite meaning insect? <laughs> yeah, so I was telling Marnie that this presentation is kind of, it has no rhyme and reason. It was just some of my favorite bugs and their weird behaviors, mm -hmm. but the whirly gig beetle um, is one of my favorites. Um, and that's why it's in there because um, when I was starting out as an entomology student, um, they're one of the ones that I learned about first um, up at Stone Labs. There was um, a lot of those in Lake Erie on the beaches. And the fact that they smell like pineapple just tickles me to no end. So I'm like, they're pretty cool. And I have lots of favorites. Okay. They're pretty, and insects are awesome. But I, uh, like I was saying, I have no fondness for ants, even though they're amazing and they're creative and they're, you know, they can, I overwhelm predators that come into their colonies and they can sting and they can bite and they can fight and they rage war. They're their own little social system, but you know, get out of my house. <laughs> so. uh, all right. Uh, just a few more questions and then we're going to wrap this up folks. Um, and these are a couple more cicada questions. Do mm -hmm. cicadas only lay on native species that they have evolved with? Oh, that's a fabulous question. Yeah, I, don't I don't know the answer. I don't think I've seen any preference. It's just like where they've emerged, they're going to be kind of, they don't travel too far away from where they emerge. Again, they're not very strong flyers. So, you know, they're, they get what they get, you know. So I haven't seen one species being more preferential than another. At Mansfield, we had them on uh, bush honeysuckle mm -hmm. and autumn olive. So both invasive plants. We had them on poison ivy, uh, you know, yeah. so. I, I don't grapevine? Know. Yeah, Again, grapevine. They have great survival strategies yeah. and they're laying multiflora wherever rows. they can. Yeah, we saw them on multiflora as well, so. Mm -hmm. So that, that suggests to me, back to that rose question, if we're seeing it on multiflora, keep mm -hmm. those roses covered. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And then the very last questions, we had 57 questions. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> Wonderful questions and Ashley sends wonderful an answers. Um, 
it's really just a comment, but it can kind of lead into a little description. Carol is, is saying that the Carolina manted egg egg cases are very different from the Chinese manted egg cases. So maybe Ashley, you can tell us a little bit about the difference there. Honestly, I wouldn't have noticed. So if they are, awesome. Yeah. But I, okay. I, haven't, I haven't paid attention to that. So I'll have to take a look. Yeah, I know we had the, I found one in my yard and I just assumed it was the Carolina since we had the Carolina in my yard, but mm -hmm. I'll have to look into that too. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, Ashley, thank you so much. I mean, read through awesome. the chat. You, there's some fantastic comments about your presentation skills. Well, thank you. Entertaining. <laughs> um, and everybody, please, please help us thank Ashley. I'm going to pop up a slide really quickly that I didn't uh, pop up before. I apologize. It was accidentally hidden in my PowerPoint. But Kathy and I did want to share that we do have some upcoming events. We are going to be getting back to some in-person classes. So we're going to escape to the real forest in July and August. We're gonna do some little um, walkabouts in the woods at the, uh, on the OSU Mansfield campus. So watch for that, uh, for more information coming out on those classes, but you can save the dates now if you'd like. And then we have a couple webinars scheduled coming up in July and September, one on forest and soils, and then one on walnut syrup, which would be really Ooh. 